Hello again, everyone. Harriet from the Lending Library with Stuart Innes, past president and current member of the Bonsai Society, as well as Bonsai enthusiast, as you will see. This is part one of a two-part presentation with Stuart, where he will be giving a general introduction to Bonsai, which includes the history and explanation of what Bonsai is, as well as artistic aspects. And before we start, I'd like to mention we have a number of garden resources, as well as information for the beginner to the expert gardener. This includes print resources, as well as our RB Digital and Overdrive services for ebooks and e audiobooks, and gardening e magazines such as Gardening the Easy Way, Home Gardening, and Gardening for Shade. Browse and download ebooks and e magazines using your Winnipeg Public Library card at winnipeg.ca forward slash library. We also have a gardening info guide that contains links, book suggestions, and more, a variety of different types of information and resources. Click on info guides on our website to find this and our other helpful guides. Hi there, it's Stu Innes here. Um, this is part one of a introduction to Bonsai. Uh, there, it's a two part uh, series. Part two will cover more of the horticultural aspects of Bonsai, uh, talking about things like how do you turn a little plant into a Bonsai, some things about care and maintenance, what type of, of uh, species of plants we grow, and a little bit about uh, how you might go about joining uh, uh, the hobby if you were so interested, but uh, this is part one. Now I do want to clarify right off the top that although I am a member of the Bonsai Society of Winnipeg, and I certainly support their cause, um, I'm not acting on their behalf today. So if you do have any concerns with, with anything I say, please don't blame the uh, society, it's all my doing. So um, part one, we're going to cover a little uh, history on bonsai, just enough to kind of understand where it's coming from, um, what is bonsai and what it is not, and then spend quite a bit of time going through different examples so that you can understand the different styles and, uh, and types of bonsai trees so that when you're looking at a, a bonsai or a display, you can perhaps better appreciate what you're looking at or what the artist is trying to portray. Now, many centuries ago, nobles in China would go out into the mountains in China, and of course there's some outstanding landscape there, and they might notice that trees were a significant part of that landscape. They might even notice that the trees on top of the mountains were short and squat or even twisted and gnarly, whereas the trees in the sheltered valleys below could be tall and broad and very symmetrical. They might even notice that trees on the side of the mountain tended to have these long branches reaching out into the sunshine and uh, then being knocked down by ice and snow in the winter or falling rocks. They might even notice that individual branches in some cases were of interest and sometimes even evoked a certain emotion, either tranquility or tension or something like that. So when they came back home, they could ask an artist to produce a, a scroll, for instance. But even there, you would find that trees tend to be a, a significant component of that, uh, of that landscape. But instead of that, in some cases, they would ask their gardeners to try and recreate a sort of landscape like they had seen using small plants or trees on a ceramic tray or a, a rock slab and ultimately they might even start putting one or two trees in a small ceramic or porcelain pot and at that point the trees started to become the main focus the individual trees that is and so from that grew the practice of bonsai mostly in china to begin with and china still uh, have many people practicing bonsai today although it might often be called penjing there um, especially if it involves several trees or a landscape, that sort of thing. And the Chinese uh, style tends to have a lot of curving trunks and, and rounded foliage uh, uh, clouds, uh, which is consistent with a lot of Chinese uh, cultural aesthetics. Uh, a number of centuries ago, Japan conquered parts of China and then brought back this hobby to Japan. And uh, 
a lot of the Japanese cultural influence and, and artistic influence then impacted uh, bonsai. And it, it, most people would say that that's where the modern practice of bonsai mostly uh, began. Um, and one aspect that you'll notice different in many Japanese trees is the, the designs tend to be very angular. And as I understand it, the triangle has some significance in, in Japanese culture. Uh, but there are also horticultural and artistic reasons uh, for the triangular shape, which we'll maybe talk about in a few minutes. And you, you find that very often in bonsai, that the, the uh, horticultural, the artistic, and sometimes even cultural influences all, all come together and so that the the rules that you use in designing a bonsai can be uh, a conglomeration of all three of those things at times. Now, after the Second World War, a lot of people traveling to and from Japan uh, brought back the hobby with them, and some bonsai practitioners in Japan started uh, moving around the world or doing demonstrations and so on around the world. And so it started to spread to places like North America, Europe, Australia, South America, and so on. And it, it was still several decades really before there was a, a large enough nucleus of, of people who were knowledgeable in these areas for bonsai to become uh, reasonably popular. And uh, it was actually only about five years ago that, that bonsai really started to catch up with the rest of the world in using modern technology. And so now you can find bonsai courses on the internet. Uh, there's a fellow in the US that, who puts out a two hour stream every week, uh, pretty much year round. And so it's, it's an exciting time even for people like myself who uh, could have only wished to have had that kind of understanding 20 or 30 years ago when we were starting. And, and with this new knowledge, uh, even the artistic part of bonsai is is growing significantly and, and evolving quickly in different parts of the world. For instance, people in North America are now making trees that look like trees uh, growing on the Rocky Mountains or, or in the Precambrian uh, Shield in Canada. People in Europe are making trees that look like uh, trees that grow in, in the Swiss Alps, as opposed to just trees that, that grow in the mountains of Japan. And so again, the, the uh, hobby is evolving quite quickly. So it is somewhat exciting times for us. So then what is bonsai? Well, first, what is it not? Um, bonsai is not bonsai, which is spelt with a Z. Bonsai is a, a Japanese expression of surprise or excitement. Um, bonsai is not topiary, which are those little trees or shrubs that are styled typically in geometric shapes or shapes of animals and birds and that sort of thing. Bonsai are always in pots and they're, they're intended to look like great trees. Uh, bonsai is not a species of tree. There are literally hundreds of different species of plants used. And it's not just an indoor plant. All of our trees are outdoors in the summertime. Uh, they need the, the sun and the wind and uh, the humidity and just the tropical trees uh, come in in the wintertime into our homes. The outdoor and, and hardy trees need to go through a winter period, although we generally put them in a very sheltered area. Uh, bonsai is pronounced bone as in give a dog a bone, and sai as what you might do when this presentation's over if I do well. So you put those two together and you have bonsai, bonsai. Uh, bonsai literally means a tree or landscape in a tray or pot, and it is a combination of art and horticulture. In fact, I think it's probably the most balanced hobby that I know of in that, in that respect. If you look for a book or a video on bonsai in, in Europe or Asia, you would look in the art section of a library or a, or a bookstore. In North America, you would look in the horticultural section. And that just speaks to sort of the equality of those two things. What is the goal then of, of a bonsai artist? It's to yield a miniature vision of trees with great character and actually oftentimes with an emotion attached to them. 
And, and so what does great character mean? Well, it can mean a lot of things. But just to give you a sense of, of the types of visions that we try and recreate, I like to always show a picture of a, a Japanese or Chinese garden because to me that's halfway between the reality of a mountainside and a bonsai pot. Uh, we share a lot in terms of the types of species we grow and how we prune them and that sort of thing. Here's a, an example of windblown trees that we saw on the south coast of Australia. And individual trees here aren't so attractive perhaps, but the, the collection of all of them responding to a very strong prevailing wind is of interest. Uh, these trees we saw in on Rim Rock in Billings, Montana, and it was not just this tree on the overhanging rock here that caught my eye, but also the tree cascading down the side of a hill, which is very similar to many trees on mountain sides. This tree, you can probably tell where it is, is on the edge of the Grand Canyon, and to me it, it epitomizes what what uh, bonsai growers are trying to represent. This tree is literally clinging to the side of the cliff. Uh, it's faced with snow and, and ice in the wintertime with great heat and, uh, and drought in the summertime. Just looking at the branches, you get a sense of its history. And we always say a bonsai tree uh, tells you a story. You can just guess what this tree has experienced. And yet in spite of that, it's still thriving. So this is, this is something that would inspire a bonsai artist. This is probably the most beautiful tree I've seen. It's in Kew Gardens in London, England. Uh, it's a cedar of Lebanon. And in spite of its great size, its majesty, you might say, it still has that very delicate feel. And here's a, a small bluff of trees growing on an island just outside of Eucalypt uh, on Vancouver Island that we saw about a year ago. And this might inspire bonsai artists to create a small forest. So this might give you a sense of, of what gives us inspiration and what we're trying to represent. Sometimes it's even uh, parts of the trees. For instance, who doesn't like seeing a maple budding out new leaves in the spring or, or some trees on the side of a, of a lake or even the gnarly old trunk on a pine tree? And you might be surprised to understand that these last three pictures are all pictures of bonsai. There's no greater compliment you can pay to a, a bonsai artist than to take a picture of his tree and then not be able to tell is it a, a large tree in the ground or, or a bonsai tree in a pot. Uh, so a little bit about bonsai basics then. There are many styles of bonsai trees and we'll go through some examples of these but you couldn't cover them all in a day. Uh, there are rules of course to styling as there are in any art form. Uh, once you understand them though, and, and these rules are a combination of what makes the tree look nice aesthetically and what keeps it healthy horticulturally. Uh, once you understand those rules, as in any art form, you start to break them then, but with knowledge. Uh, there are many species of trees, bushes, and other plants used, uh, many hundreds actually. Typically though they are uh, naturally trees or bushes, but things like ivy and geraniums have even been used to create bonsai. Uh, all bonsai are in pots, which have feet and drainage holes. Uh, there's a reason for that, that uh, all plants, but especially trees, need not only moisture on their roots, but they need oxygen. And by oxygen, I mean fresh air. And so the feet help to keep the pot up off the table and make sure that fresh air can get into the soil as well. Uh, the only exception to that is if they're planted on, on rock slabs or on rocks themselves. And we'll see some examples of what I mean by that. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read or to see all of these things, but it just gives you a sense of sort of many different styles that bonsai can take. But on the left of the screen, you'll see uh, what we call the inclination of the trunk. There's five basic styles there. And if someone went to tell you uh, what style his bonsai was, he would start probably by, by saying which of these styles he's talking about it. And we'll sort of go through examples of these. So here's an example of what we would call a, a formal upright style bonsai. And, and an upright style would typically represent a tree that's either grown in a, in a big uh, uh, 
sheltered valley where it's well protected, it gets sun and wind from all directions and it can grow very symmetrically, or perhaps a tree on top of a small hill where there aren't strong prevailing winds. Now this, this tree is quite a, a rugged look, you might say. It's, it's got a very a wide base here. It's quite angular in design. And you notice the pot sort of matches that in the sense that it has sharp angles all over the place. Uh, the pot in a bonsai composition is equivalent to the frame around a, a photograph or um, a picture in the sense that uh, the pot is not there to be seen so much as to help set off the tree. So it might complement the colors or contrast with them. Uh, the style of the pot generally will match the style of the tree. And in many cases, it, it's a rather dull color and it's just really representing the earth underneath the tree. Now there are exceptions to that, um, but very often bonsai pots are, are quite dull colors, you might say. Here's what we call the informal upright style, and this is probably the most, most common style uh, for bonsai. So the top of the tree is still more or less over top of the bottom of the trunk, but the trunk can be curving or zigzag, can have all kinds of motion in it. And here you'll notice that uh, this pot is actually round, which sort of matches the, the curving nature of the bonsai tree. And even here you might notice that there's still a somewhat triangular shape to the tree. And one of the reasons for that is that um, having that shape guarantees that all parts of the foliage uh, get direct sunshine. If, if part of the tree shaded another part of the tree, that lower part would probably um, not do very well and eventually die. So, so here again, the triangle shape is aesthetically pleasing. It's horticulturally important, and there is even some cultural aspects to it as well. This is an example of a deciduous tree. It was, uh, we saw it about a year ago in Vancouver Island. It's a uh, trident maple, which would normally grow in Japan, but it's a beautiful example of how you make a small plant look like a, a large old tree. You can see the roots uh, sort of pushing up out of the ground, the broad base of the trunk, uh, the trunk tapers gradually until it just becomes small branches at the top. Some of the, the large branches further down are sort of falling down under their own weight. Um, there are definite clouds of foliage, so you can somewhat see where each of the branches are in the tree. And we always say in bonsai, you need some spaces for the birds to fly through, and, and this tree has that as well. So it's, it's an example, I think, a very good example of how you make a small plant uh, look like an old tree with a lot of character. This is a slanting style, um, which means that the top of the tree is, is uh, no longer over the center of the base. Uh, and this tree, a slanting tree, uh, firstly generally represents trees on the side of a mountain or on the side of a river bank, or perhaps on the edge of a forest reaching out to get to the sunshine. Uh, this one definitely represents a tree on the side of a mountain. Um, and you can see that much of the bark and even some of the ends of the branches have been broken off, uh, perhaps by falling rock. Uh, maybe even lightning or just under the weight of snow and ice. Um, from an artistic point of view, it's also somewhat uh, a dynamic design, I, I think you'd say, because the, the trunk sort of heads off in one direction, but the foliage heads off in another. And, and so it's quite interesting uh, artistically as well. We would call this pot a moon pot or crescent pot. Uh, now this is there's, there's two forms of cascade bonsai. This would be a semi-cascade. Uh, with cascade bonsai, you generally have one very large branch that's a major part of the design. And in this case, it really is just one large branch going off to the side. Now you can also have a top to the tree, which we'll see in some of the other examples, but, but not always. Uh, what makes it a semi-cascade is that the end of this branch is between the, the top and the bottom of the pot. Uh, and so this, this moon-shaped pot gives you the sense of a tree on the side of a hill, and the, the so-called boulder here just adds to that sense of being on the side of a mountain. 
and you notice it, if you can see that some of the, the colors in the rock match the color of the pot, other colors in the rock tend to match the color of the bark and the tree and the moss somewhat matches the, the color of the foliage. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of support here for the tree, even in the pot. This would be called a, a full cascade or cascade design because the end of that major branch is below the bottom of the pot in this case. And this tree does have sort of a, a top to it as well. We would call it a, an upper apex. And it's a very angular design in a sense. You see a lot of motion in the branches. And so the pot reflects that in a sense by being quite angular in design as well. This is a, an even more extreme case, more vertical design of a, of a full cascade. Um, this would be a, a Japanese garden juniper or percumbens juniper. And that's something that you can find in Winnipeg. Uh, some of our members do grow, although it requires a, a special care in the winter time. And we'll talk more about that in part two. Um, but it is something that's practical to grow here. And I should mention with this very vertical design, you end up with a much taller pot as well. And certainly it, it, it matches the design of the tree. And it also gives you even more sense of being on a tall cliff on the side of a mountain. Here's a triple trunk design. Um, there's actually a third trunk. It may be hard to see in the background there. But if you look at this from the side, it gives you that, that sense of depth. And, and bonsai is certainly a three-dimensional art form. Uh, this is actually uh, an eastern white cedar tree, so it, it's a native tree that you can find uh, in the white shell, for instance. This is a forest, uh, many trees on one slab. Now, this looks like a rock slab. It's actually a, a man-made slab in this case, but this is about four feet long and four and a half feet high, I would guess, roughly. Uh, these are larches or... Uh, um, tamarack trees. So these are the conifers that have very feathery foliage that turns yellow and falls off in the fall. So it's a deciduous conifer. And it is, it is a native tree in Manitoba and it's, it's one of our favorite species as well. It's quite easy to use as bonsai. You might notice that one tree died on this forest, but we don't remove it. That just adds to the, the sense of reality of a, of a forest in nature. Uh, this is an, a different kind of forest, a sort of different aesthetic, completely more, I would suggest, of a, of a Chinese kind of style with all the curves and, and rounded foliage masses. A lot of what we've seen were fairly rugged designs. This, this I would call a very delicate design. It's a Japanese uh, maple forest. Uh, you notice quite slender branches and, and small uh, trunks as well. Uh, and the foliage, of course, in the Japanese maple is very feathery, so it gives you that very, uh, very uh, delicate feel to it. But you'll notice that it still overall has a somewhat triangular shape, and certainly all the foliage is going to get full sunshine pretty much. Uh, Literati bonsai is, is probably the most artistic and least realistic form of bonsai. Uh, not so realistic in the sense that you can find trees like this, but they're rather rare and unique. Uh, but if you understand uh, literary art, uh, one of the goals of that is to represent reality with as few brush strokes as possible. And so a tree might have been represented by just two strokes to show the trunk, uh, a few other strokes to show the branches, and just some little squiggles to show the foliage. And so a, a literati bonsai is kind of a, a real interpretation of that. Uh, they are usually quite uh, long trunks with a great deal of motion in them, just a few branches at the end and a little bit of foliage. And so you might say they're the least realistic, but when they're well done as this one is, they can be quite outstanding to look at. Uh, root over rock represents trees that have grown on the edge of a, of a mountain or quite often on a river bank and the, the roots have had to grow down around and through rocks but then the soil has eroded and it leaves the tree looking like it's clinging to a rock and in some cases they probably are 
and this is just a picture I took in, in Puerto Rico a few years ago to show an example of how that happens in nature. Here's, here's a very well done composition of root over rock. This is a cotone aster, um, which still has fruit on it. Um, this whole area is actually a rock. It's hard to see because of the moss. Now, moss on a bonsai very often acts as uh, grass growing underneath the tree, but in this case, the moss actually helps to prevent evaporation of the moisture out of this very broad, shallow pot. So it, it takes a little bit of moisture, but it actually prevents a whole lot more evaporation. So it, it actually helps with the process here. And again, you'll notice the, the uh, comparison between the color of the moss and the foliage, um, between the color of the rock and the and the branches and roots and so on. We always say a bonsai has to tell a consistent story in the sense that if something causes the branches to be curving or angular, then the, the same forces would act on the trunk on the entire tree. And so there is a consistent story here with, with uh, the, the curving trunk, the curving branches, and even the curving roots in this case. It's a very well done composition. And you often see sort of mountain sides or, or mountains in the ocean, uh, which is very common, especially in, in southeastern Asia. Um, we would call this a root on rock in the sense that the roots are growing in soil on the rock. Now we actually sometimes grow trees in porous rocks like lava rock or featherstone as well. Uh, we get the roots started and then they just grow into the the holes in the rock and we literally just water the rock as opposed to the trees. Uh, when you see a, a large rock representing a mountain like this and then a smaller one beside it with smaller uh, plants on it, this is not representing a smaller hill. Again, bonsai is a three-dimensional art form and so what the artist is trying to portray here is that the smaller rock is in fact another one of these mountains but off further in the distance. Here's just another example of that kind of uh, form. This is a, uh, a different kind of rock and a fairly new composition, I think. Uh, it looks to me like the, these uh, trees are, uh, are fairly new. But the interesting thing about this is that they're trying to portray a fairly tall mountain. And I say that because the trees in the top are short and squat and a bit twisted. The trees a little further down are cascading down the side of the mountain. And as you come further down the mountain, you find deciduous species. And, and that's really what you would expect on a, on a tall mountain. There are many different styles. We call this broom style. Uh, things like beech trees tend to grow more like this. Uh, there are certainly flowering bonsai. Uh, of course, in Japan, the, the cherry tree blooming in the spring is is of quite significance, but in North America, you're, you're probably more likely to see an azalea growing. Uh, this was an azalea growing in Vancouver Island again, just a beautiful tree. And in this case, you notice the contrast between the color of the pot and, and the color of the blooms. So that's, that's deliberate. And of course, they're both very rounded, curving shapes. Uh, you can have very large trees. Now, unfortunately, in bonsai, we still use a lot of terms like four man trees and and feminine or masculine designs, we're trying to change that. To, uh, this tree uh, would probably actually take more like a forklift to move it, I think. And you can get very small. Uh, we would call this thimble size. Now, one thing to understand is that the really small trees aren't necessarily easier to make or to look after. Every little piece of foliage and every little uh, hair on the bark on this tree is of significance. So, I, it would be very difficult to get every piece of foliage uh, sort of budding out at the same time as this uh, person has. And I have some small trees, not too many quite this small, but you can end up watering them five or six times a day in, in the hot summertime. So it, it takes a great deal of work. And they're often, the smaller trees are often displayed in a, in a stand like this with, with many of them together. You can have very delicate, uh, very heavy designs and typically the pots will match the, the tree in that sense. Or you can have whimsical. This 
this is a little uh, bougainvillea. You'll notice again the contrast between the color of the flowers in the pot. It, it doesn't follow too many um, of the rules of bonsai, but who cares? Who wouldn't like something like this in their house? Uh, you can have windswept designs, and in this case also a tree that's intended to be seen in the winter, in the sense that there's no leaves on it at that time. Uh, if you have foliage on your plant, it's easy to hide a, a blemish or a flaw in the design, but you can't do that on a, on a winter scene. Every little uh, piece of, of twig on this tree was deliberately placed uh, and sized appropriately. And in Japan, they're quite often shown in alcoves uh, called tokonami. So you might have a bonsai tree, a scroll, and a small plant or a smaller bonsai or a viewing stone or something like that. And people who get into bonsai quite often do get into other forms of Japanese or Japanese-related arts, things like viewing stones, uh, orchids, and uh, even the, the um, ikebana, the Japanese flower arranging. I, I've ended up getting involved. These are a bunch of what I call companion plantings. And we would put a small companion plant with a large bonsai in a show just to kind of add to the sense of landscape. And, and uh, so I've even got a hosta down to about two inches high now using some bonsai techniques. Uh, I will leave you with a, just a photo, impromptu photo taken in one of our members' backyards. He's a very talented grower. And this is just a small piece of his collection, but it, it might give you a little bit of a sense of, of what can be done with trees in Winnipeg. He, he has many uh, coniferous types of, of bonsai, uh, spruce, pine, uh, cedars, junipers, that sort of thing. But he also has many uh, deciduous types as well and some larger forests. But this will, will give you a sense of what's possible. Now, I have left my contact information here, and, and just for your information, there's the, the link to the Bonsai Society website as well, and they have lots of good information there. I'll, I'll have some more uh, information of that type in part two as well, I think. So I think that's it. I'd like to thank you for watching. Thank you, Stuart. A great introduction to Bonsai. For those of you who have tuned in, thank you for watching. Please follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks again.